Well, hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Inquire, the show that aims to bring people together from across a wide range of different worldviews to explore ideas and share life together. I'm your host, Jez Field, and it's great to have you with us. Thanks for checking out the channel. Uh, now in today's episode, I have a conversation with my good friend, Dr. Paul Frost, who's been on the show before. And last time we were discussing the beast of boredom and how people, how we as human beings structure time to cope with monotony, boredom essentially, and what that says about us. Well today, Paul being an expert in industrial relations and having studied work for almost all of his professional life, I thought it'd be fascinating to get him on the show talking about the history of work and how attitudes to work have changed across the civilizations, starting in classical Greece right through to modern capitalism and the impact of globalization on the way we think about work. I thought it was a fascinating conversation. We cover a range of different subjects and topics. To kick things off, I asked Paul the question, what have you learned most about yourself over this last few months when we've all been quarantined or had our worlds and lives disrupted as a result of the global pandemic. In part, his response was just how lucky he is to live where he is and to have the range of interests that he has in his life. And having recently retired prior to lockdown, he said that he doesn't miss work and actually is grateful for how much he's got in his life. I then picked up on that concept of gratitude and asked him as an atheist, to whom do you express gratitude for the things in your life, which led on to a fascinating way into the conversation by talking about entitlement and the power of thankfulness over earning. Now, as we listen into Paul's answer, don't forget to hit the like or subscribe button if you enjoy what you hear and would like to have more Inquire episodes. Um, to whom do you feel most grateful? Uh, and I would say to my parents. Okay. I think my parents were both working class parents who worked hard and strived for their son to move along and did everything they could for me mm. to educate me, uh, to give me a good grounding in a solid home uh, where it felt amazingly stable in South Yorkshire, where a huge family. Mm. Uh, and if I and and that I think set me on a train to a career that I loved, that was uh, well paid. Uh, and I um, met a lovely wife who was of like mind. And so I, my gratitude would be initially to my parents and family location, which mm. enabled me to grow in such a way, both intellectually and in resource terms, to be in this particular position. Mm. This, this, uh, this isn't a pointed question in any way, but do you, do you ever find yourself articulating that gratitude to your parents out loud, even though you might not necessarily believe that they're there listening. Yes. Yeah, it happens that my mum is very ill now and has been over the summer, uh, and my dad and I, um, I take her for a walk in a wheelchair around the estate to give my dad some respite. And uh, I, I tell her, I think on every trip, she has Alzheimer's, so I tell her on every trip, um, how I could not have been in this position if it wasn't for her, what my dad and she had done for me as we were growing up. Wow. Um, and that, you know. Um, wow. Well, because I think, you know, she's she's still strong. She had a physical today, so, but in any other ways, her body is beginning to crumple in some very distasteful ways for her, very unpleasant and life's not good. And so, no, no, I, t I think almost on every trip, because I, I know she never remembers from the last time, you see. Mm. So I, I'm not, from her point of view, I'm not repeating myself because yeah, she, yeah. she doesn't remember I said it, or at least there is no sign that she remembers I said it. So no, I tell them, I, I tell them, every, I tell them every time that wow. um, that, I, no, that I am grateful. I think, um, I mean, I try and say thank you to people all the time for things that get that get done. But for this one, this was a, you know, it's a, it, I feel the family network from which I came mm. um, very strongly. Mm. Um, Strongly, uh, mm. and uh, and particularly, my parents did things for me that I'm not quite sure I could do for my children. They un so unselfishly, you know. Wow. It, uh, you know, 
Well, well I, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you're you're right, living as we do in history. I find myself so incredibly not just grateful to God, of course, but for the fact that we we are living and reaping the benefits of all the previous generations that have come before us and the hard work that's gone on. Every time you turn the light switch on, you that that you know light comes out of your light bulb because someone somewhere is breaking themselves to mine resources out of the earth, to, and someone else somewhere is turning them into energy that we can then just. Mm-hmm you know pay for it's it's remarkable so it's i, I mean we could stay on this topic because i think there's a couple of things that's quite interesting the 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 healthy the importance of the healthy effect of gratitude as opposed to entitlement mm-hmm. um, but i and i think it, there is a link to our what we're going to be talking about with work because you know some people could look at an estate or a beautiful view or something that they've done and and, and attribute it all to their hard work and say I have done this I deserve this mm. I work I've worked hard for this and mm. of course you know the things that come our way don't come away by accident often it is a result of a lot of hard work but that doesn't seem to be as healthy a response to appreciating the things that we have to attribute it to our own hard work I mean what are your reflections on some of that uh, yeah I think to to, to regard <laughs> Yeah, I'm often inflected by what I'm reading at the moment and, and often resonates for me. But one uh, maybe reflection in a minute, but, you know, the sense of entitlement from people is misplaced. I, I often find it completely misplaced, um, just as, um, you know, it might be somebody who, after 400 years of building a cathedral, puts the final stone and said, I've just built a cathedral. <laughs> it's like, well, there were 400 years of people doing something before you put that final stone on or any, at any other point. Yeah. In, in modern terms, the Internet, nobody designed it. It was. A, and I think in life, yeah. the fact that I am where I am, I am a contributor. But only a, a contributor in the context of where I came from. And I happen to come from a very positive, a very affirming, very loving a, a set of parents who prized education. Mm. And and so the bit I did was, if you like, not quite the capital, but like in building the cathedral, it was another another brick in the stones that they had all laid and that their parents had laid for them and their parents had laid for them. Mm. And they all moved and kept each other alive and kept each other healthy and helped each other with work. And I just come along and I, I get the benefits of all of their previous mm. love and working with each other. And then that's poured into me. Uh, and um, so it, it's not a matter of that Paul Frost is entitled to anything. I'm just lucky to be that the, the, the point I'm living my part. I happen to be living in it. I'm, I'm in this great place, but yeah. I would not have been without without them no doubt about it uh, i mean it puts a certain amount of that perspective puts a certain amount of uh, responsibility on our shoulders to make sure we hand on or uh, carry on building a project it absolutely does our generational generational heritage is and what, what's interesting is that uh, you know you may use the example of a cathedral of course uh cathedrals are impressive because people feel like they're building it for some extremely high purpose and calling um mm. i'd love to raise the conversation in a moment about whether or not people have such a high calling to build towards anything anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, if if our end goal is our own comfort and happiness, mm-hmm. well, we're all just banging our heads against the ceiling all the time because it seems that we couldn't make ourselves any more comfortable than we already are. Of course, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, living longer and being healthy for longer is going to be people's goals forever. But um, that's just quite and, and interesting. What, as you were talking, it strikes me that um, is is this is entitlement something that that grows out of the soil of capitalism that essentially redirected our the focus of our work away from the glory of god and towards the glory of self and so if i've built it for my glory then i've deserved it and i am well done me yeah i think that's, I think that's true i think you know if we, in a minute we, we, we you know we can look about is work, work is work natural it does work have a moral value does it did it have does it have doesn't it have but at, at the point at which it switched from uh, high moral value for a higher purpose believe mm. it was serving a, a higher being the moment it switched from that to serving uh, mankind then in the move to capitalism it all changed mm. I think, you know it it changed people's sense of entitlement i think i agree with you um would have been heightened yeah I, I've produced this surplus value. It's down to me. I get to keep it. 
Yeah. And yeah. I get to engrandise myself as a consequence of it and because I deserve it. Mm. Mm. And I, I think entitlement's only really possible when you have a very stable and comfortable existence as well, isn't it? Because, you know, for most of human history, they're just happy to still be alive another year, survived another winter. <laughs> well, the, people, the, the people to whom, you know, people in the UK ought to be satisfied are the people who set up after the war, the, 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 the very first seeds of the European Union, which despite anything to do with politics, and it's not about politics, and about Brexit, is that they were just so sick of war from the Napoleonic Wars, all the way through the wars, people have been dying in mass numbers, slaughtered in war, and in, in, the, in the 20th century wars, and in, in, in uh, 19th century wars, except all of them. Uh, and so the people who finally took a stand and said, enough, let's have some, let's do some talking, then, our life, my life, I, you know, I'm the ba- I'm one of the baby boomers in the, from the 1950s. You know, we have had a golden era because that set of people mm. um, decided and, and managed to do, unlike after the First World War, when there was the big intent, but not the institutions to do it, really. After the Second World War, the institution in European terms was put in place, which by and large, despite some issues in the, in the, in the 90s, and early 2000s, I'm thinking of Kosovo and the rest, but principally, we, we, we have been able to be stable. I mean, in, stable in a way which we don't even appreciate now. We think of instability, COVID's made us unstable, but prior to that, financial instability, in, like, relatively speaking, <laughs> that's still stability. When you've got war <clears throat> and millions and millions and millions dying, that's a, the that's a level. Of, and so um, the, the older generations, I think, feel they never feel aggrieved by it they seem to just be a pair of people who can absorb that after what they've done but they it must be a little bit galling to see to see me and other and other people younger than them walking around like it's all fine what's your problem you know we're entitled to this it's like well <laughs> you know we did have some part to play in stabilizing the world in which wow. at a fundamental level so in terms of you know talk about that what are you grateful for you know one could have also mentioned those people for stabilizing Europe, mm. which therefore industry could grow, invention and innovation could take place, wealth could be created, the NHS could be created, and we could all therefore be living in warmer, comfortable, turn on the tap and hot water comes out. Now look at that. Mm. Turn on the light and the lights come on, just mm. like that. Um, I mean, I'm I'm, ne- I'm never so grateful for things like that than in the middle of winter and I haven't got to walk to the end of my garden to use the toilet. <laughs> yeah, <indeed. laughs> well, that too, you know. Um, so there, there's a lot of gratitude that the people ought to have. And um, I think it does produce, as you were trying to suggest, a more stable sense of who you are if you have your position placed in the lineage uh, and, and you are not the end. Yeah. Your, your children are not the end. Your grandchildren are not the end. Um, it, it's just that, you know, the lineage moves on. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Powerful. All that, Paul, from just your lessons from lockdown. <laughs> when it goes to your questions. So much. Right. Well, you've touched on it there, really, and, and starting to talk about recent history. But what I'd love to get you to do is just to... Something you've shared with me before that I always find so interesting is to share that kind of thumbnail sketch of the theories and philosophy and attitudes towards work dating back into antiquity long before you were born i should add <laughs> even uh, that even that and of course i i mean i forgot to introduce at the beginning but you're a, a a professor doctor you know phd in industrial relations that's why this is your specialism but uh, paul take take us back to ancient greece where we're well, all wearing togas i think the question that in, in, enthralled us jez was the one of is work natural it is going to work a natural thing and therefore, and is not and is not working an unnatural thing. And is there pressure on the unemployed for not working? And it's kind of it's it from that the question is: Is it natural or unnatural? And I think we often assume in our world it is. But if you track back to me, a place where much of our civilization comes from, from the Greeks and from Aristotle, then you find that it was not, in fact. Uh, and, and a great book about that, which is it's it's dated now, but it, it's from a, a beautiful guy called Professor Peter Anthony. It's called The Ideology of Work. Um, and in it, he uh, he tracks the, the history. And just just a couple of phrases, Jeff, not long. Um, work was not taken seriously in, class, in classical Greece. It was not assigned the moral value which it has gained in the in the tw- in the 20th centuries. 
Uh, and then it moves on to discuss discuss other things, but it sets the tone there. Work for Aristotle, Aristotle sees it, it gets in the way. It, it, it stops proper the proper pursuits of citizens and citizenry. It's it's about wasting time on inferior activities, corrupting corrupting the soul and making the pursuit of virtue more difficult. That so for, for this set of people, work was not natural. Work was not what citizens mm. did, um, not what, what people did. Um, the big problem, of course, is that work does need to get done in a society. And I think the issue that we would have with this society's solution to that was slavery. Well, we'll just get some people who are not, get some beings who are not really human and they're not citizens of, of the state and therefore they can do it. And when they don't, we'll beat them uh, and we'll compel them to do it through effectively violence or thuggery. Um, but it, it, for that set of people, they... Um, their imperative to work didn't exist in, in a way that we is na feels natural here now because we've taken it in. But um, so that was the, that position. And then um, one of the, the lines is, is that Christianity came along. There, there was the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ and Christianity and Christianity. And then it becomes, wait a minute, this, this slavery is immoral. This is not the right thing. You can't. This is not the way to treat people. Uh, and so that begins to attack the, the issue of slavery and therefore who can do work and you moving rapidly through uh, the developments of Christianity into Martin Luther and Calvin and, and particularly there's a lot of discussion around it in, in terms of Protestantism and what became known as the Protestant work ethic. Uh, and in the Protestant work ethic, the big issue here was, no, no, we all work hard. Work is good. Hard work is good. We're, but we're working to show our devotion to the Lord, to God. We, it's for the glorification of God that we work. It's for our soul and for our, our futures. Uh, and so work itself was, was good. Working hard was good. Signs of ostentation, signs of wealth were, not, were frowned upon. The problem was, uh, and there's a great um, uh, quote from Weber who talks about uh, Protestant work ethic being an absolute necessary precursor to capitalism. That because all that had to happen then was we'd moved from slavery, we'd moved from work being a na not natural, we'd moved to a position where work was a good thing, working hard was a good thing for the glory of God. We just had to make one switch. We had to stop working hard for the glory of God and start working hard for the glory of ourselves. And so the birth of capitalism brings all as many of the other things it brings in terms of the division of labor and exploitation and surplus value, it brings a, a fundamental shift, the second fundamental shift in work and how it fits in society, because we're not now working half the glory of God. We're, we're permitted to work, but for ourselves, for ambition, uh, a meritocracy develops uh, and all that flows from that. Um, and so we're now in a position of heightened consumerism, putting the focus on self, putting the focus on uh, larger piles of whatever it is you want, because we're entitled to it, because as we talked about earlier, because work is I'm, it's for my, my own glory. My, and, and therefore, final note is what comes with that, once work is, is, is gloried in both, play, in both in the Protestant times and in contemporary times, not working receives, let me put it, a very bad press. You know, you're not uh, you, you're not seen as a contributor. You're not seen as successful in contemporary terms. You're a failure. And you know, we, I think from my point of view, sensible, reasonable people would see that that is just because you are not employed. A failure that does not, you know, it, it, it doesn't make you a failure. It, you may, may not be changing, chasing the same goals or income levels. So that that's the, the rough history from... It was not it was not natural to work. It was completely you know, not natural, uh, not immoral, really, uh, probably immoral to work. It was not seen as a good thing to do. Moving through Christianity, moving through Protestantism, moved to capitalism, moved to 21st century consumerism and um, the underpinnings of what work is about, how we feel about it and how doing it and not doing it. And why we do it have changed dramatically mm. uh, over the past what two and a half thousand years wow <laughs> that's amazing oh there's so much there and there's i mean my, my mind is like splitting in five different avenues of conversation to take some of that because 
Um, but let's let's take a moment to just so to, to revisit some some of that up. So in ancient Greece, in ancient times, um, to be unemployed was celebrated. <laughs> you were yeah. considered to be uh, you know because well, only slaves worked um, proper, and the goal of every human was to be a citizen because slaves were non non human. And how interesting that that's shifted now that to be unemployed is to feel, feel less than human, um, uh, which is a complete reversal. Yes. I mean, I think, as I understand, the citizens of Greece would do some work around their own place, around their own estate or their own home. But work as we see it now mm. would not would not be seen as a thing to do. It would, as we hear from the quotes from people like Antony and Associated, um, it was wasting. You would be wasting your time on inferior activities, corrupting the soul and making the pursuit of virtue more difficult, which is what was what citizens were designed to do, yeah, not, yeah. not working. But there, there was. The, I mean, even that quote was interesting. There was a pursuit. There was something that that was understood by the society as being worth pursuing, namely virtue. And things that got in the way of that pursuit um, were considered bad. And, and in one sense, that, that's still true for today people have the things that they pursue and work that doesn't help them get there is seen as um like meaningless or just menial and mm. something to be gotten rid of but the the thought strikes me paul that you know i talk to i talk to friends who are business owners and for many of them their goal is to get their business to a point where they don't have to work and it just makes their money so they can then be free to pursue mm -hmm. whatever it is that they've deemed as being uh, a higher good mm -hmm. than them breaking themselves for this this work yes so it's not completely it's not completely different to, to greek society now well it the, it, what they're pursuing um i mean it, it's predicated on the fact of um They've, they, they've, they've, they've constructed something which produces enough surplus value, profit, um, for them to be able to just own it. Uh, and ownership is an interesting issue about who owns things. But um, in this case, th the owner profits because they say, I take the risk, I'm the entrepreneur, I own it, therefore I deserve, I deserve the profits. And so, yes, it's not, uh, they're not, they strive to not work in, in, that, in that sense. Um, but they still strive to, as we move on, they, st they still strive to take the profits, to take the benefits of everybody else who's working in what they will say they have constructed uh, 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 by organising, by funding. Yeah, and, and certainly many entrepreneurs, they do work enormous amounts of hours. They do take enormous amounts of risks uh, and other people don't. Um, and therefore, um, they, they say that's, that's the rationale for why it all should be attributed to them. Um, so I, I see the point that you know they are not they strive to not work, but I think the the underpinning of why they're not working uh, is not quite in the same way. I mean, it's, work was just not to be done; it was to be done by by people who weren't human, uh, citizens, yeah, who yeah. not work because they would do higher order things, as opposed to just take the take the surplus value and spend it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think in in the moves through history that you made there. Uh, there is implicit underneath it a way of seeing the world, an ideology that shapes how people think about work mm -hmm. to the point that although um, although the behaviour of a modern business owner and a philosopher in ancient Greece might on the surface look similar because they don't want to work, they just want to live. What they're living for is quite different and what they see the purpose of work and the, and the meaning of life as being. And so I think it, it comes back to what is the purpose of work why do we work mm. in the first place and perhaps even then to ask the question what is work um is because work isn't just something you receive money for no, no. Uh, so what i'd love to hear your reflections Sad, sadly you, you could ask many females over the past 50 years if, if work was if work was all it was that work was the only thing you got when you got paid for it because they'll tell you actually no they, they work enormously hard and enormously long hours and they don't get a bean for it yeah they, yeah, but it. yeah motherhood is devalued in our society because it we only seem to value that which we can monetize yes uh, yeah and that's i think that's creating a crisis of its own yes the thing you mentioned earlier which uh, in just a moment ago was um about why people work uh and I think we could probably accept that at a base level, 
most people are working because they need to earn a living. They need to be able to, in our monetary society, they need to pay their way. The, the, often the critical question is why they choose to work at what they work at. Uh, and, and so why do people become nurses in our society who attract not very good re rewards? And what, the, the distinction might be worth making at this point is between um, extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. Extrinsic in, in simple terms would be cash. Intrinsic would be a love of it. I, I, I want a job which helps me, enables me to help people, to love to get people well. And different jobs offer different um, proportions of that. And some people prize each of these differently. So they, some people will choose a job with high levels of intrinsic rewards, uh, and they're able to do so at this point in their life, even though it has low extrinsic rewards. Uh, and that's really what they're actually, so they'll pick a job which they feel is beneficial, is powerful. You, for example, mm. a very talented uh, man, very bright man. You could do many things, I, I certainly think. And you choose to do what you do um, for a much, which doesn't earn you enormous sums of money. You don't manage to have driving Ferrari cars and live in big houses because for you, the value of things in life are, are not there. They're somewhere else, and therefore you, the nature of the job you choose is, is more in tune with your philosophy of life, the, your understanding about the purpose of life. And not everybody's obviously blessed with being able to make that choice, um, but when they are, uh, at a particular point, I, it's interesting to ask why they chose, if they had a choice, mm. why they chose to do what they did. And mm. another thing that's happened is... Um, there used to be things, and I think they still exist, but today's thing called occupational communities. Uh, and these were, if you were born in a fish, if you were born in Hull, and for the past four generations had been fishermen, there's a pretty high probability that for some many years you'd have been a fisherman. Or if you were born in uh, Rotherham or Doncaster or, or South Wales, there's a pretty high chance you'd have been a miner. Uh, and, and so these are, are around where Pilkington glass was, either worked in the glass works or people just went where previous parents had gone. And that's through mobility, in some ways through education, has started to break down and people are less bounded by those occupational communities. Therefore, there's the question of choice arises more for them. And they thought, um, and if you think of now, or the people who are listening now, think of where their cousins are, where their brothers are, where their sisters are, they're probably dispersed across the country far more than they were even in the 1960s, just you know, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's enabled people to make choices um, mm -hmm. to some extent on where they go. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the, the, why we work is one question, why we work at what we work at. Um, I think our, if we can choose, taps into what you were speaking of before about our philosophy on life and philosophy on, on uh, and what we think it's all about yeah and i mean just sticking with that that thought there about uh because uh, you know you use me as an example i think i i would if i was analyzing critiquing why i've made choices that i've made in in one sense i've made choices out of a very kind of just deeply held conviction of trying to be faithful to what i see as being the old the bigger purpose of my life on mm -hmm. the earth and so, oh, and but then that also comes with it, brings with it a sense of feeling trapped because you you're not no one's really free to just chop and change as you like because you have certain loyalties that you feel based on what you think the purpose of your life is about. You you are beholden to them in in some way mm -hmm. to the point that if you want to if you want to be satisfied and you want to be content and you know mentally stable in life, you have to almost try to live in. Um, in line with your your deeply held values and if you try to break away from them to think i'm just going to pursue a career seeking extra extrinsic rewards and financial gain mm -hmm. you i don't think people who have a high sense of intrinsic meaning um mm -hmm. Would 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 find that a comfortable road to make? So they almost couldn't. So in some senses, we are kind of trapped <laughs> within our within our makeup. And I think sometimes the the jobs that we we choose and thrive in are often things that correspond to the gifts that we've got individually. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure there's there's many jobs that I look at and think there's no way on earth I could ever do that. I just 
I could I'm not made for that. Mm -hmm. So we are see we have this feeling of being made differently. But coming to this, that's a roundabout way of trying to want to talk about the, this this thinking about what is the meaning and purpose of work because. I read something that really just said the reason the Protestant work ethic developed as it did was because under the ancient Greeks, of course, there was a big divide between um, what we might call the sacred and the secular space, mm -hmm. um, the, the spiritual or the higher existence, and then just the menial earthly, you know, you've got, got to get rid of it. But under Christianity, I mean, you mentioned everything was done to the glory of God, which, of course, was a big part of it. But it also like built into to Jewish and Christian thought is that this earth is spiritual and working this earth is an act of worship. And it's a I mean, I've got a quote here from Martin Luther, who insisted that the farmer shoveling manure and the maid milking her cow pleased God as much as the minister preaching or praying. Mm. And so there was a flattening or a destroying of that divide between mm. secular and sacred to the point that everything mm. suddenly took on transcendent significance because this is God's world. And so the work that we do is is working with God's field and God's activity and he's somehow working. And that that shapes a psyche of a people to make them think what I'm doing matters. Yes. Which of course, you know, is it makes people open to manipulation. Um it, it, even even the construction of the sentence about uh the nobility of uh of work. Are you still there? You seem to Yeah, sorry. You 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 smirked. What was the smirk for? You froze. I couldn't. I couldn't tell whether you were. You you you, you, you just stopped speaking mid sentence, and your image froze. So I was like, Oh, oh I see. I'm sorry. I was making. I was making a really profound point that you've missed now. So. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that the, the, I think I heard enough to say, that, and, and I was just to put it. Um, well, just not quite for the sake of it, really, but. Um, people with a vested interest in you working hard um, had a vested interest in, in in helping you understand the nobility of, of mucking out the cows, nobility of starting in the pouring rain and in the freezing in the freezing weather with an upcart turning the land. There's a nobility in that, Jess. There's a nobility in that work. It, it, it's a, a spiritually assigned work. And oh, by the way, it's OK for me, too. So you crack on. So it, it, it it's it's not difficult to make a conspiracy out, out of, yeah. of that existence by intellectuals who would write that and, and and talk about the nobility of work and the nobility of work i mean come on some of the <laughs> some of the work was backbreaking dangerous and, and downright unhealthy in the worst ways and then to to ascribe a nobility to it um it had to be done um mm. and, and that seemed to, that see that tended to go with it i think part of it was what happened was as as the the real essence of it that you believe and speak about, and I think people as that was moved on into capitalism, it took that sense of nobility, the discussion of nobility of work with it. I mean, trying to convince miners that they should be down the pit 10 hours a day, five days, seven days a week, six days a week, because it's noble. There's a nobility in hard work. It's like, really? No, you come down <laughs> then and be that. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 I suppose I guess I'm partly disputing your point, but also saying it was if if it was real at the time, and if it was true and honestly felt, it was I think taken up and distorted and used for improper or immoral purposes, as as that sense of um, telling you is there is a nobility in it. Yeah, I think the, there yeah, was. I, I think that's a, that's a really valid point that you make. I think. Um, I mean, you're also charitable enough to recognise that it, it was it was open to manipulation, but wasn't necessarily coming from a, a conspiratorial place. I think, you know, the Apostle Paul was a was a manual labourer who worked mm -hmm. leather and preached on the side. And mm -hmm. so, you know, someone like the Apostle Paul, who's laying the foundations of the Protestant work ethic, is speaking from a position of doing backbreaking work night and day and often shipwrecked. So he's not he's not sitting in his university tower just thinking, well, this is a comfortable existence. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, Paul, I think in a society where people just didn't have the choices, there wasn't social mobility. So no, no. You, you were stuck in your station. Yes. And so given that you're stuck in your station, how are we going to best help you find value and meaning in it? Yeah, no, I, agree. I agree. On the one hand, you could think we need to help, you know, 
improve your quality of life. And I think um, the fact that communities were so so much clo more closely knit than they are now and the centrality of, of churches and the, the value of, of spirituality and a meaning in life probably had a massive life enhancing effect on those people who were doing backbreaking work, because if there is a God in heaven and their work mattered to him, then it really does count. It's not just a conspiracy. There really is some value that's being added to it. And like we said at the beginning, we can be grateful because of the backbreaking hard work of our ancestors. We're mm -hmm. here, you know, reaping their hard work and benefits. But I do take your point completely about the miners. Um, you come down here and give it a go if it's so good then. <laughs> I think the other thing about it is as the nature of work changed, I mean, what work people did in in, in societies which were where work was dominated by or, or there was a much greater degree of artisanship. Um, so a, a carpenter would have made a chair, all of it, or would have made a table. Um, the division of labour um, changed things fundamentally. So instead of hiring four people each to make a table, I then hired Jez to make legs, Fred to make tops, so, and so on and so to make struts. So instead of creating and carving a table which would have had a kind of fulfillment in itself you just made legs and fred just made tops and the little guy made struts so whatever nobility there was or might have been a reward in the creative aspect the division mm. of labor stripped all that out mm. and uh, and therefore, in endless and countless numbers of places from textiles to automotives to all places work was dehumanized because in, in the name of efficiency and in the name of maximum surplus generation profits. Uh, but, and, but the thing about why there's an argument made by Anthony himself about why capitalism and communism are just the same. They are no different, he says, except in one small matter. They both pursue division of labor. They both pursue aggressively the generation of surplus value. And then they go, OK, in capitalism, the entrepreneur says, that's mine, thank you. And in communism, it says, oh, no, we'll now we'll now distribute this. Mm. And they never quite did. So it was what was and, it, and in the in the aggressive pursuit of surplus value in each in each political and economic situation, heavy industrialization took place, heavy division of labor took place. And all that was generated from that exists regardless of the economic conditions, enormous mass masses of of alcoholism in, in, in Eastern Europe, because, and that's how it was manifesting itself, mm. that sense of alienation appearing out of that. So th there was a sense of, of where you started in an agrarian society and in a heavily artisan society where there was a fulfillment in the artifacts you produced. The division of labor moved to the point where in fact, Jez, you're becoming a bit of a pain. So if we'll get a robot to make these legs, thank you. I don't need you at all. Mm. Uh, and there became um yeah, that then pitched off in another direction but yeah i mean paul you've yeah you've just struck on something that i'm I, I feel so passionate about and i think it's absolutely beautiful just you're absolutely right as soon as we rob work of its of its art artistic dignity mm -hmm. then i think you're absolutely right we dehumanize work and the people doing the work and even just it's fascinating to me because capitalism and communism what you said there about them ultimately resulting in the same problems um i've been thinking for a while and and, and read something some time ago now about how the worldview underpinning both of those is different in the sense that capitalism um prioritizes and emphasizes the individual and communism prioritizes the community the, the collective gathering and and underneath both of those is a way of seeing the world that says on the one hand, at its at its base basic level, the universe is a collection of isolated, you know, individuals um, who are separate from one another. It's dualistic. It's me against you. Mm. And whereas communism, at, at its root level, emphasizes everything is one, and we need to get back to this state of oneness. And where I think the thought gets really interesting for me is, I think in Christianity, you have an emphasis and a celebration of both the individual and um, a prioritizing and valuing of the community because we have in in my way of thinking the universe at its 
at its fundamental level is both united, it's one, but it's also diverse, it's three. The, the Father, Son and Spirit being that is behind all of this. The reason that matters for then, as you see the, the, the shoots above the soil of the ground that flowers in Christianity, is both the celebration of the individual that was distorted into capitalism and the dehumanizing of work um, we get that the valuing of the individual but we also get the the clubbing together for the common good because we believe in the importance of the the united whole as well mm. so i find i mean i i don't think i articulated that very well but i think that's so yeah what's really going on here again is the expression and the full flowering of I think, basic level or base level worldviews and ways of understanding ultimate reality mm-hmm. uh, is ultimate reality monistic, dualistic, like one, two, like, or is it Trinitarian? Boom, mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's great. I mean, it's, it's a lot, I've, I've gone along with a lot of that, despite my theological position. And, and, and there's a lot, there's a lot in that, you know, and the, 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 the issue about if it, you know, it, the problem with communism is how it was written and articulated by by Marx and how it's been lived out um, in the only places where we where we know. But it, it remains true that in those societies which were articulated themselves as communists, still drove hard on the division of labour. They still wanted to maximise the output, and and it was that the production of the division of labour, the re- the removal of artisanship and individual creativity in in, in both of those economic types, which produced. The kind of behaviours which were common, or the underpinning that you didn't get a lot of strikes, uh, but you still got the internal conflict, the, in, the ter- internal dissonance about what was happening that manifests itself collectively through trade unionism or individually through alcoholism uh, mm. in other places. So, um, they, which is why often uh, and certainly Weber writes that, that it's, it's industrialization which is the big has been the big problem. And 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 um, division of labour at at its heart, uh, and the produce and the production of dehumanising work, uh, that, that's yeah. caused that's caused the problem. I, I, but some people, as you mentioned earlier, are trapped into it. They, 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 there's no alternative. And certainly, if if in a society in which work is seen as a good thing, not working is therefore automatically a bad thing, mm. and therefore. If you're doing a bad thing, you are a bad person. Mm. And, and, and certainly in the parts of, of the of, a, of the um, not the last century, the the, the, uh, the the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century, then why would you be supported? It's only after this after the Second World War, the welfare state comes to offer support to the people who were not automatically bad people because they hadn't got work. Mm. They just, the, the system wasn't producing it for them; they weren't assigned it. But if you, it's not difficult to see people being either thinking of it themselves or being caused to think work is good, not work is bad. People who don't work are bad. Mm. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't, that's different in the past as we've, as we've discussed. And the more uh, work is, is for extrinsic purposes to produce uh, wealth for mm. self, mm. And then the more that becomes pressured or, 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 or seems to be problematic. Therefore, you know, we need to cut, it's interesting if you look sometimes in government policies, if we wish to motivate the rich, we cut their taxes so we can leave them with more money. If we wish to motivate the poor, we slash their benefits to force them to go back to work. But there isn't any work for them to go to. So there's a different sense of what motivates people at different places uh, at different points in the scale. But um, Anyway, wow. maybe we're stressing further from where you wanted to go. No, this is very helpful. I mean, very fascinating, interesting, could go a lot of places. Well, I think I'm conscious of time, so we're going to draw things to a close in a sec. I suppose I just wanted to get your reflection on something that I was thinking as you were talking about um, capitalism and, the, the, and your sequence of history. I was thinking to myself, where does it go from here? Because as you put it, if capitalism, or as Professor Anthony put it, if capitalism is working for the glory of self, Mm. then what's interesting to me is that in a world of globalization, where we're aware more than ever before, that the question gets raised, well, whose glory should I work for? And which which self is most important? If I'm working for the glory of myself, should I do that while trampling on the um, on the climate 
that affects people in Bangladesh, mm. do I have a responsibility to the whole? I suppose I just wanted to get your thoughts. Like, is is there a how, how has globalization changed capitalism or how, uh, this, not that it would change the system, but how has it changed the way people are thinking about work? Um, is that something you've considered before? Um, yeah, I think globalization. Um, I find I think it brings benefits and, and, and problems, really, certainly uh, to the West. And, and we see them. Um, we, we, we globalized over to China. We globalized over to other other economies and uh, in a way exploited them so that we could have cheap products. And we gorged ourselves on, on cheap products, thinking that we deserved them uh, at the expense of people in other places. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was exploitative, I think, of them for our benefit. Um, but in fact, the wheel is turning now because we are, uh, there's a growing dependency on us, mm. by us, on them. Um, and so the, the whole world, I think, is, is, is wrapped by it. I would like to think, um, but I, I'm not convinced it will happen, but I would like to think that people would see, move to a kind of, uh, a sense of bet beneficial, caring capitalism, if you like, and not in a trite way, as the politicians will tell you it is now. I think in a meaningful way, which is caring for the environment and caring for people who are ill and caring for people um, who are currently uh, not well in, in mentally or physically uh, and not regarding not work as a crime. Uh, mm. And... But sadly, I, 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 maybe I'm just trapped by my own history and mentality. I, I struggle to see where that will come from, uh, particularly in at this point in, in our history where we see um, people electing seemingly authoritarian leaders who then people who just prize authoritarianism and keep it and keep things divisive um, and. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could be more optimistic at the end. Ask me another one because that's not very optimistic, and I just I just can't quite see it. Or or, or the situation will have to get much worse. I mean, the issue, the the, the, the thing that that Marx thought was that capitalism would, capitalism would destroy itself, that people would see it's, but it's not doing. It's a very agile chameleon, and it has been for over a century. Mm. It moves, it morphs uh, as a, as a philosophy. And, yeah. But it, it prizes at its heart growth. Mm. You know, everybody talks about growth. What growth rate have you got? And yeah. if you think about a pound when I was a boy is worth nothing now. Yeah. And, and, but everything must grow. And I think until people realise it just can't grow. Yes. Growth is not infinite. The, the world can't grow to have an infinite sized population. Economies can't. It's the pursuit of growth at the heart of capitalism, which I think is questionable and it yeah. is unsustainable. Yeah, I tell you where, you know, where I go with that is I think the emphasis on growth needs to mature. As a child, you're obsessed with growth. When you become an adult, you're, concess you're concerned, you should be concerned a lot more with depth. So I think about my kids. They want to. They want to impress their. They want to impress their peers and impress themselves by growing. But there comes mm. a point in our lives where we stop and we realise. I actually. I want my parents to be proud of the man I am, mm -hmm. not just the wealth I've accumulated. Mm -hmm. I want to appreciate my character. And so I think. I mean, that's on a, on a familial, individual level. But I think I'd like to think that that could happen on a society level. My my hope comes from the fact that um, that that flower is possible out of Christian thought, because if there if there actually is a loving Heavenly Father, then I see my role as a pastor is trying to help people in the church realize it's not just about your, your life going up and to the left, up and to the right, getting better and better and growing and growing. It's actually about you going deeper and deeper into a soul satisfied appreciation and depth in your life and relationship with God. Mm. And you're, you know, or you might say, um, 
settling into and appreciating your place in the world and seeing how interconnected and meaningful it is in the whole and the grand scheme of things rather than constantly being concerned with your individual growth mm -hmm. as a as against other people's individual growth mm -hmm. uh, now yeah i i, I read recently hey, I sorry no go on I was just going to say, I read recently that the word Christian is a terrible noun and a good act, uh, and a good verb. It should be that we, we talk less about Christian and Christianity as a noun. Mm. And we we get back to actually pursuing the verb at the heart of it, which was the, the teachings of a of a penniless carpenter's son mm -hmm. who taught about the, the importance of learning to to live in God's world and trust God's goodness in and amongst a world of chaos and difficulty. Sorry. Mm. I wanted to just try and find a concrete example for me about um, the way in which a, a, a modest political change would would help. Was um, I've spent all my life in education. I wanted to to, to work and help people learn things. A, a, a fact I really object to is this: that uh, the philosophy which says you have to pay for your university education because it's an individual good. You are the beneficiary of it, therefore you should pay for it. Society shouldn't pay for it because you're the one who benefits. For me, that is absolutely fundamentally wrong. Mm. It, a, a, a government should come from a position which says an educated population is a good thing. A priori, it's a good thing. We mm. should seek to educate everybody uh, because we believe it is a societal good and therefore society should pay for it it should not be something because the the, the, the other one reinforces individuality i'm paying for my education i'm going to be the one who's smarter therefore i'm the one who should be paid more because i've paid all these fees you haven't not appreciate and that sets mm -hmm. the next generation into a kind of individualistic self-opinionated set of thoughts where and so when i hear all political parties in the united kingdom and, and in western europe arguing that the, the students should pay because they're the ones who benefit it's not simply bad business it's not simply bad for the economy it's bad fundamentally philosophically mm. for the nature of the society i mean for my wow if 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 a, if a politician would say as i would Civilized societies have three main ingredients. The three principal duties is that their citizens should be treated fairly in a legal system and in, in the kind of the state and their security and, and, and the legal system, in their health system and their education system. And all of these should be free. So you should be able to get justice when you need it, not just depending on how deep your pockets are. You should be able to get health when you need it and not bypass it because you've got deeper pockets you should not be required and, and believed that you should pay more individualistically for education these are and therefore until my position would be these are deeply embedded in the assumption about what a civilized society is and society generates enough surplus value to fund these for its citizens mm. free at the point of delivery Anything else supports individualism, paying for private education, paying for private medicine, mm. paying for expensive lawyers, lose, not being able to, to defend yourself in any kind of case. So if, any, if there's anything, a, a small acorn would be to change the philosophy of, on those issues of politicians. And that might then filter down. Hey, I would vote for you. <laughs> wow that's a that's a brilliant way to lead things and i mean actually it comes full circle because of course what you hinted at there is that an individualism that's expressed in attitudes like that towards education gives rise to entitlement um whereas a community paid education system gives rise to gratitude and yes. we're in this as a whole we're going to get through this and even i mean the story of covid at the moment they've, they've tried very much to make it about we're going to get through this together whereas increasingly they need to borrow the language of keep yourself safe because because uh, they know that's what that's what works most of all paul yes. we've got, we, we could keep talking but this is i think been really fascinating and there's been a lot of um value in all that you've said so thank you so much for your time it's a pleasure. i love it
So it's a real pleasure, Jess. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, great. Well, we'll get you back next time because I think we want to we want to crack over on the subject of time before long, don't we? Time, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, until next time then. Until next time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that discussion with Paul. I learned a lot and I was really grateful for all the things that he had to say. Um, don't forget to hit the like or subscribe button and tell your friends. Next week, I'm having a conversation with my good friend AJ Silliers about near-death experiences, something that he has become interested in and studied for the past 10 years. It's a great conversation for both atheists and Christians alike, and I hope you stick around and join us then. Goodbye.